Good evening, Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. All right, Reverend Taylor, you're good to go when you're ready. All right. Well, let's pray and we shall begin. Dear God, again, we are thankful unto thee for all that you do and for all that you do. We give you glory, honor, and praise. We thank you for the person, the power, the presence of the Holy Spirit. We pray, Father, that we would neither grieve him nor quench him but that we would walk in the spirit that we may not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We pray that he would be our God and our teacher and that we would have open ears and receptive hearts to hear your word. We thank you and love you. We pray for our pastor and revival. We pray for strength of body, strength of mind. We pray for all who have assembled today on this live stream and those who will watch via YouTube. Keep us in your care, in Jesus' name, amen. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, we give reverence and honor to God and to Pastor Hope for providing this opportunity to share um, in our Bible study tonight. If you have your Bibles, um, Matthew chapter 25, um, I wanna work us through a parable tonight um, in the time that we've allotted. And so I've, I've set my uh, phone for the allotted time, so it's going to go off and we'll start wherever it rings. But Matthew chapter 25, and I want to look at this parable. It's, it's labeled um, the parable of the talents. Um, and really, it is a parable that has reference to the kingdom of God. And we'll point that out. So Matthew chapter 25, beginning at verse number 14. Um, and we're, we're going to walk through it. So I pray that you would have your Bibles open. And, you know, and I'll just summarize briefly, and then we'll get into the parable. You know, the landowner distributes talents, one, two, five, goes away, uh, the two the one with five gains five, the one with two gains two, the one with guy with one has his talents and the, the two and the five get well done. And the crux of the parable is the guy who does nothing. And, and we're gonna focus attention on him hopefully. Like, so let me lay a context for how this parable plays it out. So, so first of all, let's flip back over to chapter 24. So 24 will lay the context for what we're going to read in chapter 25. And in chapter 24, the, the disciples ask Jesus a question. So if you go down to verse number, I'm sorry, I have computer glasses and reading glasses. So if you go down to verse number three, it says, and he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? So they're asking Jesus to tell them about signs and what's gonna be. So the first part of the, the statement of Jesus, he begins to say wars and rumors of war, forced false Christ will come, ecological disturbances, political unrest. And then if you look at verse number 12, it's a, it's a core verse that we need to look at. He says, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. So he says, when you look at the last days and it's coming, he says, men are going to be more evil and wicked because 
iniquity is going to abound. Does that mean there are going to be more murders? Well, yeah. More inhumanity of man to, to humanity to humanity. Yeah. Right. And so Jesus lays out these ecological, political, social disturbances, theological unrest, people saying, I am Christ. All of these things happen. When you get to the latter part of chapter 24, Jesus begins to set forth a number of things. One, he will begin to say that you don't know the time nor the hours. So the first core is that you got to always be ready. So if you go down to the latter part of verse number of uh, chapter 24, verse 36, notice he says, but of that day and hour knoweth no man not the angels in heaven, but my father only. Look at verse number 42. He says, watch therefore, for ye know not the hour when the Lord doth come. So Jesus says, every day we ought to be on guard because we don't know when he's coming. That we don't take a day off. We don't take a day to say, well, I, I got more time. He says, no man knows, but you got to always be on guard. And then if you look at chapter 20, the, the opening verses in chapter 25, it is a parable, again, about the kingdom of heaven. Read the first line of verse 20, chapter 25, verse 1. It tells us, then shall the kingdom of heaven be like. So what is this parable going to be like? What is this parable about? It is about the kingdom of God the kingdom of heaven. So this is what Jesus is going to be talking about. So he says this, there are 10 virgins, five of them were wise, five of them were foolish. And they took, the wise took extra oil, the foolish didn't. They fell asleep. They all fell asleep, all 10 of them. The bridegroom intentionally delayed his arri arrival. Because the parable says, and while the bridegroom tarried, they slept, and then when the cry was made, the wise put extra oil, oil in their lamps, trimmed them, and they went into the wedding feast. But those who were without oil were left on the outside. And then Jesus tells another parable, and this is where we want to pick it up. He tells another parable now that moves from you have to always be ready because you don't know the day nor the hour when the Son of Man is coming. That to the parable of you have to be productive in your time while you're on earth. That whatever amount of time you have, you got to be productive. You got you to use what God is going to give you for the kingdom of God. You got to be productive. So let's pick it up. In verse 14, he says, for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling to a far country who called his servants and delivered unto them his goods, right? And he says, unto one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one. <clears throat> and then Jesus says, this is how he gave them. He gave them out according to their ability. You see it in verse number 15. He says he gave it to them according to their several ability. When you think about goods or talents, you need to equate that to money. So what, what Jesus is telling this parable is about individuals who were given a sum of money to invest. And the reason why we know that, if you go down to the end of the parable, if you look at verse number 27, so if you go to the end of the parable, verse 27, he says, thou, and this is when he's talking to the wicked servant, we're going to come back to it. He says, thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchanges. He says, and then coming, I should have received mine with usury, and usury is interest. So he says, you should have at least invested the money in the market and gain interest, but you didn't even do that. So these individuals took this Lord's money and while he was away, they were to invest 
they were to use the Lord's money for the Lord's benefit. And normally when we look at this parable, we look at it in, the ter in terms of giftedness, that how God has gifted us. And so the parable says that every one of us is gifted, that, that nobody begins with a place of nothingness, that everybody begins with something. Notice how he says he gave it to them according to their several abilities. So everybody has gift. Now, if you would turn, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 in the first seven verses. And then the writer here, Paul begins to deal with this idea of concerning spiritual gifts. And he says that when you look at the spiritual giftedness of individuals, it is because of what the spirit has given to us. So if you look at verses seven, let's beginning up in verse seven, right? But the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For one is given the spirit of word, the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same spirit to another faith to the, by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing, to another the working of miracles, to another discerning of spiritual gifts. But then look at verse number 11. He says, but all these worketh one in the self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So God has gifted every person. Every person has a gift. And God expects every person to use that gift while they have time. And so he says, one, you ought to always be on guard because you don't know. But secondly, you ought to always be working for the productivity of the master. So he gave out these talents and they were entrusted with this money so that they could be functional. Now notice, what Jesus says in the parable. He says, he gave one, one talent, gave two to another, and he gave five to one. And so I started working through this and thinking, um, what, what about the possibility that the guy who got five at one point started out with one? his initial giftedness, his initial place was he had one gift and he was found faithful with that one gift. Because if you remember the end of the parable, the, par the one talent is taken from the one and given to the guy with five. So let's presuppose this guy who got five started out with one and he was functional with one. And then the next time around he got two. He was functional with two. He got three. He was functional with three. And he, what was found out was that he was trustworthy with what he had. The guy who got two started out with one the last time, but he was productive with the one. And now he is at two. And guess what? In the parable, he's going to be functional with the two. This guy with one could be tricky. Let's say he's a guy that's new. He's just coming into the faith. He's, he's a new believer. He's, he's fresh out of the blocks and he got one. And now he's being tried to see what is he gonna do with the one talent that he's been given or what if this guy is being given another chance? What if he's failed in the past, but the master being who he is never gives up on us? We must never forget that um, Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. He got on a boat to go to Tar Tarsus. 
and yet God gave him another chance. Look at the failures of Peter. On the one hand, he says around the communion table, I'll never deny you. I, though all of these deny you, I'll never deny you. I'll die for you. And there he is warming himself around the fire. And that young maid says, I know you, you were with him. And he says, no, I don't, I don't know him. And three times he says, I don't know him. What about John Mark who ran with, when Paul and Barnabas were in ministry and he ran to the place where Paul says, I don't want him with, me. he can't go with us. And so Barnabas takes John Mark, and Barnabas and John Mark become functional in ministry. What about some of us who are listening today that we didn't come initially, we ran, and God never gave up on us. God continued to work with us. And then we came, and we came, and we did. And even in the midst of our doings, we've had our own failures and faults, and yet God has never given up on us. Maybe this guy, possibility is that he started out and he was a failure. He didn't do anything. And now the master is going to give him another chance to be functional. So let's look, if you will, just flip over in your Bibles to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. And Jesus will tell another parable. And this is the parable of the unjust steward. And this guy was given, he was, he was watching over the master's land. And over time, he made deals with individuals. They were supposed to bring in a certain amount of the crop and they failed to. And he said, well, we will catch up the next time. We'll catch it up the next time. And then it comes to the master's attention that this guy hasn't been faithful over co collecting the amount of goods. So he said, look, I want you to give an accounting of your stewardship. And the guy knows he's behind. And he says, well, you know, to to beg, I cannot, and to dig, I, I can't dig. So he broke his deal. He says, uh, Calvin, how much do you owe me? And Gavin says, well, I owe you 100 talents. He said, well, write me out 50. He says, uh, Sister Mosley, how much, you, you owe me 100 barrels of oil. How, how many, just give me 50 and we'll call it the day. I said, you, how much do you, you owe me 100? Give me 50. And he broke us all of these deals. And he has been unjust in his dealing. But if you will, look at, if you will, at verse number 10, what he says. He says, this is what Jesus says at the end of the parable. He says, he that is faithful in that which is least will become faithful in much. It's how you deal with the little things, not the massive big things. He says, if you are faithful with the little, you're going to be faithful with much. But if you are unjust with little, then you're going to be unjust with much. And the reason why potentially this guy with one didn't get five initially, he couldn't handle five. Couldn't handle five. That, again, according to their several abilities, that's how the gifts were distributed. And Jesus says in this parable, the master went away. He goes away. He goes into a far country. And all of the servants have ability they can do. He didn't give them more than what they could handle. He didn't give them less than what they could handle. He gave them exactly what they could handle. He gave them time. So each one of them had sufficient time to be functional and productive with what he gave them. He wasn't unjust. He didn't expect that when he got back, if he gave them an hour, he didn't expect, well, what you got from me? No, no. He gave them sufficient time for them to be productive. And 
Judgment Day comes and he takes an accounting and the guy with, with five says, you gave me five and I have gained five more. And the master says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you rule over many. And the guy with two shows up. And he says, you know, you gave me two and I've gained two more. There's, there's productivity, there's increase. And the master says, well done. He repeats the exact same language. Thou good and faithful servant, thou has been faithful over a few things. I will make you rule over many. And then the guy with one shows up. And, and he has interesting language. He begins with the words. If you look at the words, uh, his language, the guy who got one shows up. And his first thing is, I was afraid. Because what this guy did is he went and he digged the hole and he hid the Lord's talents. And he sat down, it's like Otis Ready, right? He says, I'm sitting on the dock of the bay, watching the tide roll away. And he twiddles his thumbs and he becomes idle. And he does absolutely nothing. He just waits for the master's return. He's just doing nothing, just laughing it up with his friends and, and lollygagging with his boys and doing nothing. I didn't put it in my notes, but there's, a, there's an interesting statement that Solomon makes. He says, the soul of the slugger, the lazy person, desireth and have nothing but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. He said, the lazy, the lazy do nothing, but they want so much. They do nothing. And this guy is just sitting and he is sitting and he's just there. Time is passing by and he's sitting. And then when the master shows up, he is the third person to come. And, and look, if you will, at verse 24. He says, then he which received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. That should be a problematic statement. Now, I mean, this guy, I mean, that statement should be problematic because what he said is, I knew you, I know what kind of man you were. You're a hard man. You reap where you didn't sow, you gather where you didn't straw. I know this. And I chose to do nothing. It, it, you know, I could almost hear the reverse saying, you knew all of that and you did nothing? You knew I was a hard man and you did nothing? You knew I reaped where, and you did nothing? You got to be kidding me. You knew all of this and you did nothing? Maybe the reality is, and, and in the parable, Jesus doesn't, come back and say, well, no, that's not correct. He doesn't, he doesn't say you're wrong in your assessment, that your analysis of who I am is incorrect. He doesn't say any of that. The man says, I knew you, you are a hard man. And, and I did nothing. I did absolutely nothing. It, it is the, it is the, the son that stays at home 
in the, in the parable of the prodigal son. And, and he doesn't know the father. Because if he knew the father, he should have been saying, man, when that brother of mine comes back to this house, just knowing my daddy, my daddy going to take that boy back. Just knowing my daddy, I guarantee you, he's wasted all of that money with harlots and with prostitutes and blowing all of my daddy's money. But when the boy shows up, just knowing who my daddy is, he's going to take him back. You watch. You watch. You watch what I tell you. He's going to take that boy back. That's the nature of my daddy. And the parable says he was upset and angry, you never gave me a party. And this guy said, I knew you. And then the problem with him saying that is he really didn't know. Because on the one hand, he says all of this and his expectation may be he is still going to hear well done. Maybe in the back of his mind, he's played this scenario out. I've done nothing, and yet the master is going to accept me anyhow. That I, 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 I've done absolutely nothing. I haven't participated in anything. I haven't, I haven't been productive in my ministry. I haven't used my gifts and abilities. I sat on my duff. I didn't do anything. I was, I was there in the body of Christ and I did absolutely nothing. And the master is going to accept me anyway. I did nothing. What did you do? Nothing. And I should get the same benefit, the same reward as everybody else. I knew you. You're a hard man and I did nothing. But look at the next line. He says, he gives us the real motivation behind his doing nothing. He says, and I was afraid. I, I was afraid. Afraid of what? Because that should be the next question. Well, what is he afraid of? Is he afraid of failure? Maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. Maybe we don't do anything because we are afraid of failure. And that possibility exists. But you never know until you try. Failure, yes, failure. So the question becomes, if God is empowering you, what is the possibility of failure? If God is the one who has gifted you and God is the one who is empowering you, what is the possibility of failure? Can you fail? Can you fail? It, it may not turn out like you think it should, but failure? No. It's about being productive in the kingdom. That I was afraid. I, I was afraid. And then it, it dawned on me that this sense of fear comes up from the beginning. So turn, if you have your turn at uh, Genesis chapter number three. Genesis chapter three. So if you know, know the text, Genesis one and two is creation. Genesis 3 is the fall of humanity. So the tempter comes and says to the woman, as God said, you should surely, you shouldn't eat of every tree. And she says, of all the trees we may eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we may not eat. So look, if you will, at um, verse number, did you do? Verse number 10. So this is, you know, Adam and Eve. I always say to people, when you look at this passage, when they ate, there was a behavioral change because every time before when God showed up, Adam and Eve came running to God. 
But on this particular occasion, they don't come. So God knew in his omniscience, something was known. God knew observation. When they come out, they got these fig leaves in and God knew behaviorally. But look at what, when God says to Adam, where are you? Look at verse 10. He said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. Fear. The, the fear of, I did something I shouldn't have done. And fear grips us. And that's why maybe the writer says, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and of a sound mind, of a sound mind. So he says, I knew you, knew you all, I was afraid, I digged a hole, and that's it. But if you will, look if you will at the Lord's response. He says, verse 26, the Lord answered and says, you wicked and slothful servant. In some of your traditions, it's going to read, you lazy and evil servant. It's a lazy mindset and an evil mindset to have ability and not do anything. It's, it's evil to be able to benefit the kingdom of God, benefit the community of faith, and not do anything, to have gifts and abilities, and to sit idle while others are working. And the master says, you may be pleased with your slothfulness. You may be pleased with the fact that you didn't do anything, but I'm not pleased. You are wicked and you are evil. Your mindset, your construct, the way you have behaved is out of boundary. You, you're a wicked and evil servant. You could have done something and you did nothing. You could have, you had the ability to it. You could have, you have ability. So you could have, and that's a wicked mindset to do nothing. And the final resolve is to take from the person who could but did nothing and give it to somebody who is being functional, productive in ministry. In this construct of productivity, of producing, of, of having the fruits of our labor is always out there. And so this parable, so he moves from, um, you don't know when the day nor the hour the son of man is coming to use your giftedness to the glory of God, that you got to use what you have so that you can benefit God in the kingdom. And then the final piece of Matthew 25 is going to be how we relate to other people. Well, he says, there's the goat and the sheep. And he will say to the goat, I was hungry. I mean, to the sheep, I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and in prison and you visited me. And then shall the righteous answer and say, when saw we ye sick and hungry and hungry and fed you, sick and visited you, naked and clothed you? And Jesus will say, as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. How we relate to other people. Amen. I. My clock is going off. Any questions or comments? Uh, anybody want to chime in? 
That's oh. That's the parable. I'm ahead of schedule by five minutes. So no questions, no comments. Be happy to entertain. All right, so I guess yep. we're good, right? Your clock is fast. Uh, it is, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I said it, he said, Pastor told me about 40 minutes, and so I said it for that time period, and it's 7.35, and I didn't want to go over. But I can be quite loquacious, talkative. <laughs> Any questions or comments? Well, we got five minutes, so I'll entertain. Does it make sense? Because, you know, sometimes this stuff makes sense in my head, you know, uh, but does it make sense to you who are listening? Yeah. Pastor Taylor, sense. I heard you say something that I found very uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. And I know we're talking about the parable, but the thing, because I'm such a, a diehard mm -hmm. for the prodigal son, you mm -hmm. said, had the brother known who the father was, he would have responded differently. I thought that was an amazing point that you brought out as with the servant that didn't do anything with the coin as far as knowing who the master was. You see, but that really, that stood out for me. I was like, oh, he gave me a sermon. Thanks, uh, Pastor Carlos. Reach out. <laughs> which, which is going to be phenomenal because there are many, you know, I hear statements of people saying, I know God. And God knows me. And one of the most fascinating statements people make that I, that I hear sometimes is that God knows my heart. And I want to say, do you know what you're saying? Do you really understand the import of your statement? When you say God knows my heart. So, so yeah, he really does know your heart. And knowing your heart, he knows your motives, your intentions. And he knows when you're trying to, to bluff him. You know, you know, it's like the, the prophet Isaiah. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And it is true, he does know our hearts. We can't, can't bluff him. Anybody else? Well, I guess we'll pray. Is that what we do here? We'll pray. Yeah, Reverend Taylor, you go ahead and pray us out, and then uh, I'll open. I'll open us up um, for the for the wrap up. All right. Well, let's pray. Father, again, we are thankful to thee for your word. For your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Your word, the psalmist says, have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against God. It is sweeter than the honey, even the honeycomb. It is to be more desired than gold, yet than fine gold. And in keeping of your word, there is great reward. So may we forever be students of your word. For Jesus has quoted from Deuteronomy, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And again, we pray for our pastor as he stands tonight. May you give his body strength. May you give his mind clarity. And may your spirit speak through his words that your people may hear your word and draw nigh unto thee. Bless those who are assembled. Keep us in your care. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Again, Reverend Taylor, thank you. 
again, thank you all who are here on Zoom, also those watching on YouTube. Um, uh, again, on behalf of my dad, we appreciate and, and are grateful for you all who, who show up to take part in the, the, this Bible study and, and to dig into the word. Um, it, uh, my dad is in the last night of revival tonight. I'm out of Hampton, South Carolina. Uh, I believe it will be shared um, on the Royal uh, Facebook page. They started at seven. So that's available if you want to uh, watch along um, for his last night of revival. That'll be on the Facebook page. Um, and I will, Antoinette will open you all up. And if you see somebody, say hello, as always. And, and again, thank you all for being here tonight. All right. Thank you, Ike. Thank you, Reverend Taylor. All right, thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you, Reverend Taylor. All right. All right. Hello, everyone. Good night. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Reverend Taylor. Bless thank you, Reverend Taylor. Everyone have a good night. Good session. Thank you, Reverend Taylor. Bless you. 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 Bless <laughs> you ain't tell me you were doing that. <laughs> 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 what's going on, man? All right. Hey, Reverend Dallas. 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 Hi there. Hi, Hi. Hello. Hey. Hello. Hey, Reverend Jackson. 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 Hello. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Hey, hey Sister Nadine. Sister Nadine. Hey, Nadine. Hey, Nadine. Hey, Nadine. Hey, Nadine. Hey, 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 Christopher. Hey, 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 Hey,